This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived, as the old rhyme goes. King Henry VIII is known for having a huge number of wives and getting rid of nearly all of them in some way or another, and at one point even starting an entirely new branch of Christianity, virtually identical to the old one, except with him at the head, just so that he could get rid of one of those wives. Here in the video today, the story of the bizarre love life of King Henry VIII. Wife number one, Catherine of Aragon. Henry's first and longest marriage was to Catherine of Aragon. Catherine was the youngest surviving child of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain, who you probably know as the monarchs who gave the green light to Columbus to sail the ocean blue. By the way, just to debunk the common myth about the whole flat earth thing, Columbus and pretty much everyone else in his era knew good and well that the earth was round. For more on this, you can see our video who started the flat earth conspiracy theory for more on that. In any event, the future Queen of England was born in 1485 and was engaged at the tender age of three, not to King Henry VIII, but to his older brother Arthur. You might not have heard of Arthur, because despite being his father's heir, he never became king. Catherine arrived on English shores at the age of 16 after a turbulent journey from Spain and was wed to Arthur just one month later. Unfortunately, Arthur died just six months after that, likely from the so-called sweating sickness, leaving behind a young widow with a huge dowry. King Henry VII was keen on keeping that dowry, so he arranged for Catherine to marry his younger son and new heir Henry. The pair couldn't be married right away. Being just 11 years old, Henry was not yet old enough. There was also a quarrel between the British and the Spanish monarchs over the dowry, and eventually Henry VII lost interest in an alliance with Spain and forced his son to denounce the engagement. However, shortly after his father's death in 1509, Henry VIII decided that he would marry Catherine anyway. The marriage took place on June the 11th, 1509. Nine. On June the 23rd, the pair were crowned. The couple was reportedly happy for the first decade of marriage. During jousting tournaments, Henry would lay trophies at Catherine's feet. He also wrote to her father, saying, The bond between us is now so strict that all our interests are common, and the love I bear to Catherine is such that if I were still free, I would choose her in preference to all others. However, the two had a duty that they had trouble fulfilling, and that was creating the heir and the spare. Catherine had little trouble getting knocked up, but keeping the pregnancy was another matter. Her first child, a girl, was born prematurely and did not survive. Her second pregnancy produced a healthy son called Henry, but as so often happened with babies of the age, he died when he was just 52 days old. Another miscarriage followed, then the birth of another son, who died after just a few days. Finally, Catherine gave birth to a girl named Mary, who would survive into adulthood. There are two more recorded miscarriages after Mary's birth. The lack of living son frustrated Henry, and his happy marriage began to disintegrate. He took several mistresses, and by 1526 became very interested in one of Queen Catherine's ladies' maids. Catherine was now over 40 years old, and the likelihood of her being able to produce healthy heirs at this point it seemed slim to none, so Henry plotted to annul the marriage. Catherine's first marriage to Henry's brother Arthur ended up being the marriage's undoing. Henry claimed that the marriage had been cursed because they had gone against the biblical teaching that a man should never marry his brother's wife, specifically in Leviticus 20.21 where it states, And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall be childless. Of course, that's referring to a scenario when the brother is still alive, essentially just saying don't sleep with your brother's wife. A major party foul. But if the brother dies, totally different as noted in Deuteronomy 25, 5-6, which states, If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. It further goes on that if the brother refuses to take his dead brother's wife, the woman gets to publicly spit in his face in front of the elders of the town. The Bible gets crazy. In any event, naturally, the Pope refused to annul the marriage. And so it was that Henry decided to declare himself the head of the English church, and the Archbishop of Canterbury legitimized the divorce in 1533. Catherine was forced to move away from the court and her daughter. She spent her last few years in a series of dark, dank castles where she spent most of her time praying. 
She died in 1536, denying until her dying day that she was no longer queen. In her last letter to Henry, written on her deathbed, she signed it Catherine the Queen. Wife number two, Anne Boleyn. Arguably the most well-known of King Henry's wives, Anne Boleyn was born sometime in the early 1500s, between 1501 and 1509. She spent a large portion of her adolescence in France, caring first for Queen Mary, Henry VIII's younger sister, and then Queen Claude. Anne returned to England in 1522 to attend to Queen Catherine of Aragon as one of her ladies' maids. At this point, Anne's older sister Mary was one of King Henry VIII's mistresses. Also, her family was given gifts and titles for their daughter's service to the king. From this, it is widely speculated that Mary's two children were the product of the affair, though Henry never recognized them as his own. In 1526, it became less about Mary as Henry took notice of the younger sister. Anne was not portrayed as a great beauty. There are accounts of her having six fingers on one hand and a large amount of moles and warts, though these claims are unfounded. She was, however, extremely intelligent and witty and had a unique sort of look that Henry apparently liked. However, being the intelligent girl that she was, Anne knew that mistresses could easily fall out of favor. While Henry pursued her, she largely threw off his advances and claimed she would never be his mistress. She wanted to be queen instead. Henry, of course, was still married to Catherine at the time, and it was impossible for him to marry again. That was when his lack of son, combined with Anne's allure, caused him to pursue the divorce from his first wife. It took six years, during which time Henry showed Anne more and more favor. He showered her with gifts and let her take positions of honor at ceremonies. However, Anne remained unpopular with the people of England themselves. By December 1532, she was pregnant by Henry, despite previously denying his advances, and the matter of annulment it became the king's top priority. To ensure that the child Anne carried was legitimate, Henry and Anne married in a secret ceremony in January of 1533, while Henry was still legally married to Catherine. Henry argued that his first marriage had never existed in his mind, so he was free to marry whoever he wanted. Marriage to Catherine dissolved on May the 23rd. On June the 1st, Anne was crowned Queen of England in an elaborate ceremony. By the end of August, Anne retired to her rooms to prepare to give birth to her baby. Everyone was so certain that it was going to be a boy that her names had already been decided on and a proclamation of the child's birth had already been written up using the word prince. As you probably know, it was not a prince at all, but a girl named Elizabeth who was born on September the 7th. While the princess was still celebrated, Anne knew that her position as queen was not secure until she had given birth to a healthy son. If she could overthrow Catherine on those grounds, then King Henry could just as easily get rid of her in favor of another. Anne became pregnant again shortly after Elizabeth's birth, but miscarried. She miscarried again the next year. This time, the child was a boy, and Anne was distraught. Anne had made a lot of enemies at court, and they started to plot and conspire against her. She was arrested in 1536 and brought in front of a court on charges of adultery, incest, and plotting to murder the king. She was, as you probably already know, found guilty, and she was sentenced to beheading. Interestingly, shortly before the sentence was carried out on May 19, 1536, her marriage to King Henry was annulled, and he claimed that he had never been legally married to her. Because of this, it would have been impossible to commit the crimes she was about to be executed for, but this little discrepancy was overlooked. Anne's head was removed during a private execution with one quick and clean stroke of a sword. Now, just before we continue with the wives today, I do want to take a quick moment to tell you about Squarespace. Sponsors like Squarespace really do make what we do here possible, so if you thought about getting a website, please make sure you use our link below. It does make a big difference to the show. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful online identity for yourself or your business or your brand. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content, or you can start from scratch or you can move over from an existing domain, making everything super easy to manage. And once you've gone through that super easy customization process, there's no updates, there's no patches, there's no tech BS to deal with. No one likes that nonsense. And Squarespace also handles all of the website-y stuff, doing podcasts, oh yes, mailing lists, they do that, social integrations, it's also a yes, and they do a lot more. Also, 24-7 customer support, they're there to help you whenever you've got a question, and Squarespace isn't just about an online presence, you can also totally sell stuff or services on a Squarespace site. Look, if you're looking to start a business, pursue a dream, anything like that, do it with Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash brain food to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring. And let's get back to the wives. Wife number three, Jane Seymour. 
Jane Seymour, born in 1508 or 1509, knew exactly what she was getting herself into when she allowed herself to be wooed by King Henry. She had arrived at court to act as a lady's maid for Queen Catherine and later waited on Anne Boleyn. A descendant of King Edward III, Jane was a member of a wealthy family, but didn't have much in the way of an education, likely an appealing contrast to Anne. Henry's affection for Jane developed shortly after the birth of Elizabeth, and it was this attraction, combined with Anne's inability to produce a male heir that sparked Anne's conviction and execution. Henry and Jane were married just 11 days after Anne's death. Jane was never officially crowned queen, and it's speculated that Henry was waiting for her to produce a son before taking that step. Indeed, when Jane finally became pregnant in 1537, Henry doted on her and provided every comfort she could wish for. He even claimed that Jane was his first true wife, despite, if you'll remember, the decade of happy marriage he experienced with Catherine, who he stated he would choose in preference to all others. The death of Henry Fitzroy, just two months after Henry VIII married Jane, probably had something to do with this affection. Henry Fitzroy was Henry VIII's bastard son from an earlier mistress. If Henry never had a legitimate son, it was always a possibility to get his bastard legitimized and secure his lineage. With Fitzroy's death, Jane became Henry's only hope. On October 12, 1537, Jane was likely extremely relieved to learn that she had given birth to a son, having seen what had happened to women who only produced daughters. Jane was able to attend Little Edward's christening, but she died on October 24 from complications from the birth. Henry, ecstatic about the birth of a legitimate son, was supposedly deeply saddened to lose his one true wife, who might have given him many more sons had she survived. He had Jane buried in a tomb that was being prepared for himself, and she became the only one of his six wives to be buried with him. Son in hand, now Henry needed to find another wife in order to make the spare. Not to mention Henry's split from the Catholic Church following his divorce from Catherine of Aragon and subsequent marriage to Anne Boleyn meant that England was largely isolated and vulnerable to the rest of the world. More than just a marriage for another son, he needed an alliance to boost England's power once more. The search for Henry's new wife started shortly after Jane's death, but Henry didn't marry for another two years. It's possible that he actually mourned Jane's passing, or he simply was waiting to find the perfect bride who checked all the boxes. Wife number four, Anne of Cleves. Anne was born in Germany in 1515, making her 24 years Henry's junior. Not a lot is known about her childhood, except that she once had an engagement to the heir of a dukedom which fell through. Anne was considered a desirable match, largely because Germany would be a formidable ally if Rome and France teamed up against England, as Henry feared they would. Her family was not tied to any specific region, though her brother was a Lutheran, and so they were also at some risk if Rome and France went to war against countries that had defied the papacy. Lacking tinder, Henry sent an artist to paint portraits of Anne and her sister, Amelia. The idea was that he would pick the prettiest one. Anne had been described as a middling beauty, and her portrait must have been better than her sister's. However, upon meeting his intended bride in England in 1539, Henry was less than impressed. Anne spoke no English, and so could not communicate effectively with her husband. She did not curtsy to him when she met him, as he had approached her partly unannounced, and she did not know who he was. She had little education in anything other than domestic tasks, and so did not share Henry's interests in music and literature. And on top of that, he did not think she was nearly as beautiful as reports claimed. Disgusted, Henry called her the Mayor of Flanders. Nevertheless, the treaty had already been drawn up, and the pair were wed on January 6, 1540. It is unclear whether or not their marriage was ever consummated. After the wedding night, Henry denied that they had, saying, I liked her before not well, and I like her now much worse. Due to Henry's displeasure, it was a short marriage. He sent Anne away from court on June 24, 1840, and the marriage was annulled with Anne's consent on July 9th. There were no children from this marriage, but Anne was treated remarkably well after the annulment. Henry gave her several properties, including Hever Castle, which belonged to the Boleyns, and she was often invited back to court. After a while, she became known as the king's beloved sister, and she and Henry became good friends. It's likely all of this was done because she had not contested the annulment and even gave evidence that the marriage had not been consummated. That said, when it came to Henry choosing his sixth wife, remarrying Anne was put forward as an option, one he denied. Anne was said to be extremely jealous of wife number six, Catherine Parr. Still, she ended up remaining close to the royal family and even took part in Queen Mary's coronation. However, her close association with Princess Elizabeth called her to fall out of favor in court, as officials believed she could have been plotting to see Elizabeth on the throne. Anne died in 1557 of cancer, one of two of King Henry's wives to outlive him, and the last of his wives to die. Wife number five, Catherine Howard. 
Before his marriage to Anne of Cleves had been annulled, Henry had already become enamoured with young Catherine Howard. Catherine was born somewhere between 1518 and 1527, and spent most of her childhood in the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk's household. Interestingly, she was the first cousin of Anne Boleyn, the king's second ill-fated wife. During her time with the Dowager Duchess, Catherine is known to have had an intimate relationship with her music teacher from the time she was 13. Later, she fell in love with Francis Derham, a secretary, and it's very likely that the two intended to wed. They reportedly called each other husband and wife, and Francis put Catherine in charge of his finances when he was away on other business, a wifely duty. The Dowager Duchess, however, put a stop to the relationship when she learned about it a year after it had started. Catherine arrived at court when she was 19 years old to serve as a lady's maid to Anne of Cleve. Maybe you're starting to see a pattern here. Henry took notice of her almost immediately. She was young, pretty, giggly, and vivacious. Henry called her a rose without thorns and the jewel of womanhood. The Howard family encouraged the burgeoning relationship, despite Henry pushing 50 at the time. They wanted more influence so that they could try to convert England back to Catholicism. Catherine, though likely not wholly attracted to the old, overweight king with an ulcerous leg, she had little choice in the matter. The two were married just 16 days after the marriage to Anne of Cleves was annulled. Catherine is said to have lifted the king's spirits for a time, but she herself was not entirely happy with the arrangement. She started a series of affairs which would eventually catch up with her. First, she is thought to have had a relationship with Thomas Culpepper, Henry's favorite courtier. Their secret meetings were arranged by Anne Boleyn's brother's widow, who had her own reasons to defy the king. Then she appointed Francis Derham as her personal secretary. Likely more went on here behind closed doors than simple secretarial duties. However, her previous relationship with Derham was known by most of her staff at her childhood home, and Anne began receiving requests for favors in exchange for their silence. Ultimately, though, she was caught and thrown in prison. She could have been saved if she'd simply admitted to a pre-contract with Derham, basically a premarital contract that would have seen them married in the eyes of the church. If she had agreed there was one, her marriage with Henry would have been annulled and she could not have been convicted of adultery. As it was, she claimed that Derham raped her. With evidence from servants in the Dowager Duchess's household and testimony from her old intimate music teacher, no one believed her. Thomas Culpepper and Francis Derham were executed in December of 1541. Catherine was beheaded on February 13, 1542. Wife number six, Catherine Parr. An interesting thing to note about the final wife of King Henry VIII is that she was named after the first. Catherine Parr's mother was Maud Green, who served as a lady's maid to Catherine of Aragon. Catherine Parr was born in 1512 and was raised to be a rather independent woman for her time. Her mother was left widowed when Catherine was just five years old and ended up managing her late husband's estates herself. As for Catherine, she and Henry were well matched. She had had a string of marriages before she married the king as well. Her first husband, husband was Edward Burrow, who died after just a few years of marriage. Her second was John Neville, who had two children from a previous marriage. She and the rest of her family were held hostage during the pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion, but John managed to secure their release. He died in 1543. Afterwards, Catherine was employed in Princess Mary's household, where she came to the attention of both King Henry and Thomas Seymour, the late Jane Seymour's brother. She expressed an interest in Thomas and likely wished to marry him, but the king would not give his consent and asked for her hand instead. It was not a lady's place to say no to the king, especially not a man who had beheaded two of his wives and countless others. So, Catherine married Henry on July 12, 1543. She is known for helping Henry reconcile with his two daughters, who he had previously disowned. In addition, she developed a good relationship with Henry's son and had a hand in Elizabeth's education. She was also, despite being raised Catholic, a supporter of the Protestant Reformation. She had a surprising amount of control over the king, something that worried the conservatives in Henry's court and was almost her undoing. They caught wind of the fact that she possessed banned books in her rooms, a treasonous offense, but they were unable to produce evidence. Henry died in 1547, leaving his throne to nine-year-old Edward. Catherine probably thought she would have some part in the regency, but she made the mistake of marrying Thomas Seymour shortly after Henry's death in a secret ceremony, and people were scandalized, thinking that the relationship had gone on while Henry was still alive. Instead of taking control of Edward's reign, she was given guardianship of Princess Elizabeth and Lady Jane Grey, the king's cousin. It wasn't until 1548, aged 36, that Catherine became pregnant for the first time. She gave birth to a daughter, Mary, in August. She died a week later, after complications with the birth. So I really hope you found that video interesting. Hopefully we really covered that bit of history well for you. If you did, please do hit that subscribe button. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace. They are linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.